This is the tenth in twelve in, of twelve introductory videos um, based on my book, Teaching in a Digital Age. I'd like to thank the Commonwealth of Learning for um, making the recording of these videos possible. Um, and uh, this one is of particular interest to me because I think this is going to have the biggest impact on teaching and learning in the future. The aim of the 12 videos uh, is to give a brief introduction to the main themes in the book. Uh, the book is free online um, from BC Campus, who also provided the facilities to enable me to have an open textbook through their open textbook project. And this video, appropriate enough, is about trends in open learning. First of all, the concept of open education. This is a term that's used in a wide variety of contexts and in different ways by different people. Um, probably the most important form of edu open education is a public school system that's available for all boys, all, all children, boys and girls. Um, and you know, many developed countries have had these since the turn of the 19th century. And increasingly, this is happening in many developing countries as well. And when all said and done, if we can get every boy and girl into school around the world, that would be for me a definition of open education. Another definition that happens more in the post secondary system is no prior qualifications, because most universities require minimum qualifications for acceptance. So we don't have an open system in post-secondary education in most countries. There are uh, limitations put in upon those who can, although that's widening increasingly. And a lot of what I have to say today is about widening access to post-secondary education. An another group of people um, who are often excluded from education are people with disabilities, people who can't, can't read because they're blind, or can't hear because they're deaf, or can't get into campus because they're not mobile. And in fact, there's now a set of design principles for courses that aim to open up education to people with disabilities. Then we have open universities. Um, the UK Open University was the first to not require any prior qualifications. Um, its argument was, our output will be the same as in other universities, but we'll accept anybody, but you have to get up to the standard. Then we'll see, we'll talk a bit more in this uh, video about open education resources and open textbooks and open research and data. And I've listed some of the open universities, some of the biggest ones around the world uh, here. Um, the Anadolu, uh, Open University in Turkey, the Open University of China, and NISA, the oldest of them all, actually, in South Africa. So let's, let's talk a little bit about open education resources. Um, this is content that is freely available for educational use. Um, and there are five principles of open education resources from David Wiley. These are covered in the book. The reuse of materials, you're free to use the material um, without having to get permission. Redistribution, you can take some, 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 uh, an open education resource and send it to somebody else if, uh, for their use or give it to your students to use. You can revise it. If you want to adapt it or change it, you're, uh, you're free to do so. So you can remix as well and you can retain it. Um, you can keep it. Um, as long as you want. There's no kind of license that expires on it. <clears throat> and this, this is a open education resource on the uh, uh, acoustics, music acoustics from the University of New South Wales. That's freely available to anybody. If you want to understand the acoustics of music, there's a free course for you. Now, this doesn't mean to say that there's no license on open education resources. In fact, there, there is a licensing system that protects the author's copyright. That stops, for instance, if you have the right form of uh, Creative Commons license, 
from commercial organizations taking your material, turning it into a book and charging for it and making money out of it. Um, and you'll see there's a number of different categories of open education resource and they're explained in the book. Um, categories of licensing for open education resources. And there are very many collections of open education resources. I've listed some here, um, but th this is only a, a, a small example. Incidentally, most of these are post-secondary or um, late secondary education, but Edutopia is for the, the whole of the school system. And then there's open textbooks, um, such as mine here. They're free online. <coughs> Um, BC Campus in British Columbia has had an open textbook project for several years now and these books are available now, the open textbooks are available in British Columbia for all first and second year university and college programs throughout the province. So there's no need for students, if faculty adopt these books, uh, to, there's no reason for them to have to purchase textbooks for first and second year teaching in British Columbia. Um, these books have been reviewed and approved by local faculty here in British Columbia and in Canada generally just over half of institutions use open textbooks in 2018. And I'll just put a little sideline here. Um, my, my open textbook has been translated voluntarily by volunteers into 10 different languages and this is an example of the power of open publishing because this book, which has had over 500,000 downloads, I've lost count and none of the tracking mechanisms can count anymore. It's had been that popular. I would never have reached that kind of audience if I hadn't published it openly. Now, spinning out of open education resources is a move towards what's called open pedagogy. Um, this is somewhat different from the other pedagogies I've mentioned earlier in, in an earlier video. And the concept behind this is that students create knowledge through their use of open education resources. Instead of the teacher organizing everything, instead of the instructor collecting all the materials, presenting a, a, a lecture and so on, uh, the students are encouraged to do this, to go out and find their own uh, materials and create their own um, analysis of that and create their own knowledge and their own ideas through the use of open education resources. So he, here the focus is on learners as a constructors of knowledge. Now, this isn't a new idea in education. It's been around for over a hundred years. Um, but uh, uh, the change is that there is now easily accessible. It's a form of constructivist teaching. And this is why I think this is a big paradigm shift in education because eventually all content will be free, open and available online. I'll give you a personal example here. I went to talk to my grandson who was, who was at first year of university studying physics and he was online looking at a lecture and I said, oh, is your professor online? He says, oh no. He says, my professor's a terrible lecturer. So I said, well, how many lectures do you go to? He said, one in three. I said, what do you mean one in three? Well, I've got two friends and we go and we just write down the topics because we can't understand the details. And then we go online to MIT Open Courseware and look at their lectures on the same topics because they're much better. So this is a challenge for all instructors. If you think that you're the only one who has access to content, you're wrong. The students can go anywhere for that content now. So we have open education resources, open textbooks, open data and uh, research. Um, if you have a grant now from many countries from a national research agency, you're required to publish in an open access journal, for instance. So increasingly all research is becoming open. And of course, besides specifically designed educational materials, on the, there's the whole internet which contains an enormous amount of non-academic or non-filtered uh, information. And again, but that's still a huge source of potential knowledge that 
and information that students can find, evaluate, analyze, and apply. So teaching knowledge management, teaching our students how to do that well is a key 21st century skill that we should all be trying to promote in our teaching. And this is a huge shift in teaching and learning. It's given the students much more power and reducing the, the role of the expert not to delivering content, but increasingly, and in fact, I would say more importantly, to being a kind of validator and monitor of student learning because you have to be an expert to do that. So if you want more information on that, you can find it in uh, at this URL, and the next video will be about MOOCs.